This is elasticity or high Debra number measurements, uh, part three, video two, for polymer rheology and processing. In the first part, we talked about elastomers. Um, another in critical uh, part of any sort of plastic formulation is the advent of fillers. There are many other additives, um, but fillers often interact in such a way that uh, modifies the rheological properties. So I'm going to go over a variety of common fillers that are used and how these tend to uh, either interact or not interact with the uh, material to influence rheological properties. Some examples of fillers here are wood flour, mica, clay, talc, silica, carbon-based fibers such as graphite or carbon fiber, uh, natural fibers, glass fibers, synthetic fibers, and other fibers, uh, including paper and polyaramid. The first of these fillers is wood flour. This is the least expensive of the typical fillers, and this is generally made from pine and spruce wood chips that have been chemically treated to remove lignin. Then it is finely divided into a ground wood that has a flower-like texture. And the size of the wood flower is about 400 microns. It very closely resembles wheat flour uh, in its texture. The aspect ratio of the individual particles are 3 to 1 or 5 to 1. And to give you an idea of what that actually looks like is you're looking kind of oblong uh, particles, not spherical. Typically, wood flour is made from sawmill waste, and this includes planar shavings, chips, and sawdust. To give you an idea of how fillers affect material properties, um, there's two different wood flour filled materials here. Uh, the first is polypropylene with 40% wood flour, and the second is polypropylene with 40% talc. Uh, the density of wood flour is about half that of talc, um, and ends up giving the polypropylene with wood flour a higher specific strength. In other words, strength per uh, weight of a particular material. The modulus overall of polypropylene is higher with talc, but the specific strength because of the fact that wood flour has lower density is actually lower for polypropylene with talc. The next filler I'll discuss is mica, and this is a complex potassium aluminum silicate um, mineral. Its density is quite high, uh, and it is made from minerals, uh, those being muscovite and phlogopite. It has a very high dimensional stability, high stiffness in the resulting uh, uh, material when added, and high heat and chemical resistance. This is inorganic, so um, it does not burn, and then provides heat and chemical resistance as a result. An issue with mica is that it does not wet well. Uh, in other words, mica particles tend to want to stick to each other and do not want to disperse within the resin. So often you have to use a wetting agent in order to accomplish that. And surfactants are often used. And here we have two uh, very common surfactants. Sodium stearate, which is shown here, and sodium lauryl sulfate, which is shown here. Um, sodium lauryl sulfate is a typical surfactant. It's often found in uh, detergents. Silane coupling agents are also used and this uh, promotes adhesion between the mineral fillers and the resin. And this is an example of a silane coupling agent shown here. Clays are also used as filler, and these are a form of aluminum silicate. Uh, there are natural clays, which is Montmerlinite, and synthetic clays, which is fluorohectorite. Uh, I've shown here um, a schematic of natural clay, uh, Montmerlinite, and you can see the different layers. Uh, it consists of oxygen, which in gray, uh, silicon atoms in white, hydrogen, and aluminum. Uh, you can see here. And they are often in uh, layered structures like a deck of cards. For Montmerlinite, uh, there is a, fair, is a lower density. Uh, and then for things like cloisite or southern clay, they have a slightly higher density. And these give good chemical and thermal resistance, much like mica, because they're inorganic. Uh, good dimensional stability, good viscosity control in the resulting uh, compound, and good flammability resistance. There are limitations with clay. Uh, it, it tends to be very immiscible with polymer, uh, much like oil and water would be with each other. And this is due to the very tight packing of the clay layers. You can enhance this miscibility 
uh, by treating the clay with a chemical additive. And what it ends up doing is separating those layers. And that also aids in dispersion and interaction with the polymer itself. And one particular material that they use is maleic anhydride, which is shown here. So this is kind of a what a clay kind of looks like. Um, you have a layered silicate uh, shown here schematically and then polymer. Um, typically this is what happens, which makes it somewhat immiscible. If you can somehow separate these layers and get the polymer to go in between, that's a process known as intercalation. And if you can get these to come completely apart out of their stacks, this is also called exfoliation. Uh, in the case of intercalation, this is a reversible inclusion or insertion of a material into the compound layered structures. And exfoliation is a complete separation of layers of the material. And this typically requires very aggressive conditions for you to get exfoliation. Talc is another inorganic uh, uh, filler. This is a naturally hydrated magnesium sil silicate. Uh, it provides good stiffness, creep strength, electrical and thermal insulative properties, chemical resistance, and lubricity in the resulting compound that you make with talc. And then we have silica itself, inorganic SiO2. It can be either crystalline or amorphous. The crystalline is generally natural, and this is what we think of as sand and this has a relatively high density of 2.65 grams per milliliter. There are a variety of amorphous silicas, which is, I, is what I tend to work with in my research. These are synthetic. Uh, this can be either fume silica or precipitated silica, and their surfaces can be either treated or untreated. They provide good electrical and thermal insulation, sh good shrinkage and crack reduction, viscosity enhancement, and abrasive properties in the resulting compound. That leads us to carbon-based fillers, and this includes graphite and carbon fiber. And when you're discussing carbon-based fillers, there are three criteria you're really used to differentiate between graphite and carbon fiber. Modulus is one, and then carbon content is another. When, the ma when you make graphite or carbon fiber, this involves the use of a polymeric material. And then pyrolysis temperature is the other one. And pyrolysis is de defined as thermal decomposition of a material in the absence of oxygen. So, uh, to kind of differentiate between the two. Generally, graphite has a much higher modulus than that of carbon fiber. The carbon content of graphite is nearly 100%, where carbon fiber tends to be more like 92 to 95. And the pyrolysis temperature of graphite is significantly higher, up to 2500 degrees C, whereas carbon fiber is about 1300 or less. Graphite uh, provides these properties in the resulting compound high strength, electrical conductivity, high lubricity, this really reduces friction. Graphite is also where you can buy graphite powder, uh, and this is a really good way to, if you have a sticky key or lock, graphite powder uh, really can unstick that lock because it, has, it, it really reduces friction in those moving parts and does not stick it up like what WD-40 does. This is a relatively expensive filler. Uh, graphite and carbon fibers can range anywhere between $15 to $25 a pound and their grades range from general purpose to specialty or aerospace grades. They are much more expensive than the uh, inorganic fillers that I just discussed. Fiberglass is just that, glass in fiber form. And this is a silica-based glass, uh, generally 55% silica, 20% calcium or magnesium oxides, 40% alumina, 10% borates, and then a sl small amount of sodium and potassium. Fiberglass can provide good electrical insulation properties, good heat resistance, good impact strength, good dimensional stability, and high strength in the resulting compound. There are also a variety of natural fabric fibers that are used. Sisal is one of these, and this is naturally occurring uh, from both Africa and Haiti. Sisal is also used extensively in rope making. Rag fibers, which are often cotton, uh, are often used from textile type materials. Uh, these types of fibers improve your impact strength and they provide a rough surface when machined, and this is a desirable in no-slip type surfaces, such as uh, pulleys and belts. Synthetic fibers, including Orlon, Nylon, and Teflon, are often used because they improve vibration dampening. It's also used in a combination with fiberglass, and when you get those synthetic fibers along with fiberglass, you get really good stiffness, impact strength, and good uh, anti-abrasion properties. Other fibers include paper, 
and this is typically used for electrical insulation, and polyaramid. And polyaramid is an ar aromatic polyamide. This gives a really good high strength to weight ratio, and polyaramid is often used in bullet resistant clothing. Uh, the typical polyaramid you hear is Kevlar, and these can be also uh, compounded into plastic formulations. I should mention, all of the properties that I was talking about, and when I say the word compound, all of those properties are in a plastic material that has had those fillers added. Um, and when I say compound, I mean a polymer that has had these fillers added in and compounded together, in, in, and compounding being the process of mixing. Fillers uh, that have been added to a plastic formulation like this can be either non-interactive or interactive. And in a case of non-interactive, a filler does not play a role in the cross-linking of the network. It is simply kind of interstitial, hanging out, uh, providing reinforcement or extending the uh, plastic formulation. And when something is interactive, the filler can absor absorb network polymer onto it. And whether a filler is non-interactive or interactive depends on the nature of the filler polymer system. Some of them don't mix well, some of them really don't interact, but the polymer and the filler both determine whether that's interactive or non-interactive. When you have a non-interactive filler, you can express modulus uh, according to this ex equation up here. Here you have your network modulus, and this is the volume fraction of the filler to give you an overall rigidity modulus. For interactive fillers, uh, the modulus is expressed in a slightly different way. Here you have your rigidity modulus, uh, 1 plus NL over N, with this same term that we see here. Again, this is the volume fraction. N is the number of network links per volume, and N sub L is defined as this, where uh, I believe that's uh, g capital gamma is absorbed amount of polymer. M sub N is the polymer's number average molecular weight, and uh, rho sub P is the filler density. And again, this is volume fraction. When we describe an elastic polymer network, to kind of summarize these three parts of uh, elasticity and high Debra, Debra number measurements, we can really describe polymer networks using the concept of entropic springs. And we can use some corrective measures for particular conditions, and that allows us to satisfactorily model most elastic systems, including filled systems. And when we're describing an elastic network modulus, you need to keep in mind a couple of things. One, the time scale of the experiment is short compared to the time scale for stress relaxation. In other words, no stress relaxation can occur in the time that we are observing the system, and that gives us solid type behavior. In other words, high Debra numbers. Reset and relaxation time is a function of bond energy, and these can be covalently bonded networks with a very long relaxation time that behave really as true solids, or we have physical crosslinks with shorter relaxation times, but that they show a high frequency plateau of a viscoelastic type solid. Thus concludes elasticity or high Debra number measurements, uh, and this concludes uh, part three, video two.